As Congress and the White House prepare for comprehensive immigration reform, there is much at stake in California, home to the largest number of undocumented immigrants in the country. For the first time in five decades, the controversial drilling process of hydraulic fracturing, better known as fracking, will face state regulation. As a busy travel season approaches, tips to help you navigate the not-so-friendly skies. And the highest tides of the year hit Bay Area shorelines, giving a glimpse of the future risk posed by rising sea levels. Coming up next. Good evening, and welcome to This Week in Northern California. I'm Yul Kwan. Tonight, our thoughts and prayers are with the families affected by the school shooting in Newtown, Connecticut. Now, to help those of you who would like to talk about the incident with your children, we've provided a link to some useful resources on our website. We hope it can be of some help to the, in the wake of this devastating tragedy. We move now to tonight's discussion, and joining me on the panel are Arthi Coley, Senior Fellow at UC Berkeley's Warren Institute on Law and Social Policy. Paul Rogers, environmental writer with the San Jose Mercury News. Stephen Stock, investigative reporter with NBC Bay Area. And from Los Angeles, David Lazarus, columnist with the LA Times. Arthi, let's start with you. Now, this week, UC Berkeley announced a new scholarship program for undocumented students. Why did the university feel that it was necessary to support these students? Well, yes, it's very exciting news. A million dollars from the Haas Jr. Foundation. And the university really feels strong obligation to these students because they're the, one of the most vulnerable set of students that we have. The average family income for these students is $24,000 a year. They're not eligible for federal financial aid. They're not eligible for Pell Grants. And so they've o overcome great odds just to get to Berkeley. And we want to keep them as our chancellor, Chancellor Bergenau, uh, who's been an amazing um, leader on this issue has says, we can't afford to lose this talent in California, mm -hmm. and we want to keep it here. And so not only have, do, are we offering financial aid, we're actually building a comprehensive support system for them. Mm -hmm. And we have um, an academic counselor, uh, a lending library, uh, legal support, all the things that they really need. And what's great is that this is a model that we're hoping that other universities are going to start following as well. Now, this is just the latest kind of uh, uh, development in a larger debate over immigration reform. Now, the House of Representatives just passed the STEM Jobs Act. Now, tell me more about what the bill does and why does the Obama administration not support it? So the STEM bill is a uh, bill which takes visas from what, what's called the diversity lottery, which is this great PR program where actually it's a lottery for green cards in the U.S. It takes those 55,000 visas and says, we're going to get rid of the lottery and we're going to make those visas available for people who have uh, advanced degrees in science, technolo uh, technology, engineering, math. Mm -hmm. And um, it's the only bill that the Republicans have been willing to pass out of the House. Mm -hmm. and, and what the Democrats, interestingly enough, the Democrats and the President have really stood firm on this. They support the underlying legislation. Mm -hmm. uh, they don't want to get rid of the diversity lottery. They think we can do both. Uh, but they don't they think it needs to be part of a bigger package okay. what's being called comprehensive immigration reform and that's really not just about these tech visas mm -hmm. that's about legalizing the 11 million undocumented immigrants that are in this country having giving them a path to earn citizenship mm -hmm. um, that's about fixing broken laws that make it really hard even for legal immigrants and it's about fixing the future flow because really we haven't set up a system so that people can immigrate here lawfully, mm -hmm. which is why we have so many undocumented immigrants. Let, okay. let me ask you about the prospects for the big uh, change next year in 2013. Obviously, this was a hot topic with the presidential race. Latinos uh, and Asians both voted 70% to 30% right. for, uh, for Obama. And 
I think you can document in several states, Colorado in particular, that that was the difference. Um, do you think that there, there is enough concern from the Republican side that they'll go for a, a big overhaul finally this time? Or are the sort of um, Tea Party uh, wing of the, of the caucus going to block them from doing anything big? I think the signs are showing that there is enough concern mm -hmm. because uh, Lamar Smith, who has been very restrictionist on this issue, is no longer going to be chair of the Judiciary Committee. Mm -hmm. Certain, you know, they're moving people around, and you can kind of see from some of that movement that they want someone who's going to, they want people who are willing to make a deal. Mm -hmm. I think on the Senate side, it's going to be a little bit easier. You've got Lindsey Graham, you've got McCain, you've got some people who already come to the table before. Mm -hmm. So um, it's the House that's going to be the bigger challenge because you oh. still have Tea Party. I wanted to fo follow what Paul said, talking to some sources on Capitol Hill within the Democratic Party before the election. They say, uh, they tell me that mm -hmm. they were worried this proved a vulnerability and they didn't want to sort of get out in front of this because of the fear of losing a state like Colorado or certainly they lost Arizona, but that the, the political calculus. Now that President Obama has won a second term, right. you see the mood shifting from the Democratic side and perhaps the president using his bully pulpit to more effect and essentially pushing this legislation a little more aggressively than he has in the past. Completely. And the thing is, this is the kind of bill that you have to have leadership on. It's not the kind of bill that people just kind of sing kumbaya and come together. It's a tough fight. And so without leadership, we're not going to be able to get it done. And I think the president and the Democrats realize that the ball's in their court and they got to, you know, they got to take and run and run with it. Arthur, let's take a question from David. David, are you there? Well, yeah, I'm him. I'm just wondering about the perception among primarily Latinos, but also Asian Americans uh, as to the sincerity of the Republicans. They're sort of Johnny's come lately when it comes to discovering immigration. Obviously, as we just heard, the, this election result is still stinging for them. They're keen to embrace this. They're also keen to embrace the social conservatism of the Latino community. Right. And yet I wonder if Latinos are going to say, you know what, we'll, we'll take it. We'll take any love at this point. Yeah, I mean, I think there's a, there's, there isn't a, uh, you can't say Latinos and speak for all Latinos. There are evangelical Latinos who are naturally conservative Republicans and, and, but also care very deeply about immigration. And I think the Republicans are beginning to realize in states like Texas and Colorado um, that they, if they do the right thing on immigration, they actually may be able to survive. But if they don't do the right thing on immigration, they're going to lose even people who might be their natural constituency. Yeah, they don't need to win a majority of Latinos to win the White House. I mean, in, in right. Colorado, they lost 70-30. If they would have just been 60-40, they would have won the state. Exactly. Or Florida, a huge right. electoral right. state. Right. Huge you don't need to appeal right. to Marco many Rubio Latinos now is sort of yeah. trying to woo right. the Republican right from the Latino perspective. Right, but Latinos are also, I mean, it's, it's not an electorate that's, you know, stupid. This is an electorate that can see through um, what are sometimes these fake bills, you know, that offer something but not a whole lot. All right, fascinating discussion. Thank you so much, Arthi. Now let's turn to the growing debate over the controversial oil and gas extraction method known as fracking. This week, the federal government opened up 18,000 acres of land for new oil leases in central California an area that's believed to hold the country's largest shale oil reserves. The move brings renewed attention to the expanded use of hydraulic fracturing in the state. To give us some background, let's take a look at an excerpt from Stevens' NBC Bay Area report. Except for a few pieces of machinery, the process of splitting rocks deep underground with high pressure water mixed with chemicals to release natural gas or oil goes on out of sight and until recently in California, out of mind. In fact, fracking to extract oil has been quietly taking place all over California for five decades, from Kern to Los Angeles County, Monterey to Sacramento. We don't have an exact number of how many wells in the state are fracture stimulated. You don't know? We, we don't know each individual well. So Tim Cusick is the top oil and gas supervisor at California's Division of Oil, Gas and Geothermal Resources. But as a scientist, would you like to know? Is that information you and the public here in California ought to have? Certainly we want to know and that's why I made the request of industry and that's why they have um, and they're willing to provide it. 
But right now, all that reporting and data collecting is only voluntary. Is California behind the curve on this? We may be behind the curve on some of the disclosure of information, but we're ahead of the curve on well construction. California state law currently requires strict monitoring, reporting, and regulating any oil well construction, but it doesn't require the same for fracking, not even a permit. And fracking, now. fracking is a technique that has raised some serious health concerns in communities all over the country, where it's used to mine natural gas. In some communities, drinking water has even caught fire from the high levels of fracking chemicals that have seeped into it. Last year, the oil and gas industry here in California voluntarily reported 628 fracking wells statewide. Now we don't know exactly how much liquid water is being used. We don't know the types of chemicals that are being mixed in the water. You don't know any of that other than what may be told to you voluntarily. That is correct. We don't know exactly how many wells. That is correct. Custic expects that to all change now as his office finally has begun the process of adopting new rules to regulate and monitor all fracking in the state. So Stephen, when are the new regulations on fracking coming out and how will they change the way that oil and gas companies operate? Great question. Um, they were supposed to be out already. Um, our sources within Dogger, the Division of Oil, Gas, and Geothermal uh, Resources, tell us they should be out before Christmas. Now, these will be administrative rules that are promulgated by administrative uh, office through the governor. And essentially what, what it will do will require the oil and gas industry to report when they frack, what kind of chemicals they use to frack, what kind of water, and where the water goes, how it's used and, and, and how it's disposed of once it's done being used. Have there been any environmental or health issues reported in California related to fracking? Great question. A again, the, the, the real concern here is here in California, fracking is used to recover oil, to get at oil, versus natural gas in Pennsylvania, Ohio, New York, where a lot of these problems have, have popped out. The oil and gas industry folks that we talk to um, continue to repeat again and again, there are no records of any problems with fracking here in the state. But because they're not being tra tracked, because we don't know exactly what's happening, you can't make a blanket statement and say that other than we don't know of any that any 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 repercussions so far. I, I love it when industry Stephen, talks about if I may. Vo voluntary uh, regulations. I always ask if we had a voluntary speed limit on the highway, how fast would people drive? Uh, but but the question is is about this Monterey formation that you mentioned. Sure. These are beautiful. A rolling hill south of the Salinas Valley in the sort of San Ardo Lockwood area. That's right. I, 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 this is not an area, though, that's had a whole lot of drilling, and it's not, as you've pointed out, s the same as other parts of the state because the geology is kind of tricky with fault that's lines right. and things. How likely do you think it is that we're going to see a real boom down there versus a few people experimenting and coming up, you know, not very uh, economically feasible? Great. Another great question. Uh, I have to tell you, our first report, we talked to a gentleman who lived in Monterey and where there was a fracking well next door, and they had actually gone under his land. I've got to say, Paul, because there is so much there, the federal government has confirmed this is the largest onshore shale formation with oil in the country. The potential is there to provide oil for the United States through 10 years as great as Saudi Arabia. Because of those pressures, Paul, I've got to think that there is going to be fracking in these beautiful, pristine areas. And in fact, several uh, oil and gas companies were able to bid and successfully get some of these leases for as little as $2.50 an acre, which is hard to believe considering in Kern County, it's much, much more than that, where of course we know there's oil and right now they're extracting oil through conventional means. David, you have a question? Yeah, it's just, I, I mean, it's understandable that there's these financial incentives for industry to want to pursue fracking as aggressively as they can, but it seems as though we just don't know enough about the environmental slash health impacts of this. It, it defies belief that pumping chemicals into the ground somehow is not going to get into the water supply. Are we comfortable that enough is known about this process to allow industry to proceed at such a manic clip? Absolutely not, David. In fact, that's the point of our story, that it isn't that and there are some groups who want to stop all fracking in California, but that wasn't the point of our investigation. It was we need to know more.
the scientists need to know no more. We talked to geological folks with the USGS who tell us fracking causes earthquakes, small earthquakes, but earthquakes nonetheless. Have we studied that? No. Do we know exactly what's going into the water and whether the water gets to our drinking water? No, because we just aren't studying it. We've turned a blind eye here in California, which I find ironic, David, that California, which is known as a progressive environmental state, doesn't know anything about fracking right now. And, and if you talk to the folks in Sacramento, that's going to change. But so far, it hasn't. All right. Thank you so much, Stephen. All right. Let's talk about a more familiar industry that many of us will be dealing with over the holidays, air travel. But what may not be so familiar are the new ways that airlines are racking up fees. David, you've been reporting on this. And what kind of changes are you seeing? I think passengers can accept, expect to be increasingly fracked as they're traveling, uh, <laughs> simply because the fees, the, the fees will keep piling up. Today we had Southwest Airlines coming out with a new fee. Southwest was one of the very few of the big boys who did not charge you a change fee if you needed to change a booking. Most of the other airlines will charge 150 bucks for that. Well, now Southwest says beginning next year, they haven't said how much they're going to charge, but they will charge a fee if you don't show up for a flight. This is new for Southwest. Meanwhile, also this week, we also had American Airlines unveiling a fairly radical new fee structure whereby coach passengers will have three different tiers to choose from. A basic bare bones, no frills tier where all the extras will be added on. Then a new tier, which will cost $68 more, where you'd be able to dodge that $150 change fee if indeed you do have to change. And you'd also be able to check a free bag each way. That'll save you 25 bucks per leg. And then for an extra $88 on top of the normal coach ticket, you get all those other things, the $150 fee waiver, the baggage waiver, plus you get some free booze on the flight. What does a traveler need to know about this? Basically, American collected about a billion dollars last year in change and baggage fees. What they seem to be gambling on is that they're going to make more money by offering this fee. And look at it, like the $25 baggage fee, for example. If you go for an extra 68 buck upgrade here, well, that's $50 right there. There's your baggage fee. So what American is figuring is another 18 bucks on top of that to avoid the possibility of that $150 change fee, people will jump at it. What they're not saying is, is that $150 change fee is simply unconscionable. Moreover, they are overbooking most of their flights anyway, so it's not the biggest inconvenience for them if you do have to change. And kind of what they're doing is saying, well, we're going to try and offer you protection racket. I mean, if Tony Soprano did this, we would call it protection money. <laughs> My head is spinning, David. So <laughs> why are they charging so many fees? Why don't they just increase the price of the ticket? That is a very good question. Certainly consumers have been wanting to do that, just like with cell phones, for example. Consumers want to see more transparency in cell phone prices, so don't give us all the nickel and dime fees. Just give us a base so we can comparison shop. Right. Ditto with airlines, but the airlines know full well that consumers shop first and foremost based on price. It is far and away the largest determinant in picking out an airline ticket, so they break out as much as they can to bring that base price lower. And here's also a dirty little secret that not a lot of people might know. Airlines have to pay a higher tax to Uncle Sam for all the tickets that they sell, the, the, the key tickets. But all of those extra fees and things, they are not subject to the same tax rate. They are taxed at a much lower rate. Uh. Therefore, the airlines have a very profound financial incentive to break out as much of this into fees because that means that's less tax revenue being lost to the government. That's fascinating. So da David, how is the industry doing overall? I mean, are, are they uh, recovering from the bad economy and is this like uh, generating huge profits or are they doing this because they're struggling? Uh, they're struggling. These are tough times for the airline industry. Fuel costs are a huge factor here. About 30% of your typical ticket is going to be reflected in fuel costs. And so as we see oil prices going up as the global economy recovers, and they will, inevitably we've seen ticket prices going up as well. Nevertheless, we see the losses continuing to amount. American Airlines, which we were just talking about, still struggling its way after a year of its parent company being in bankruptcy protection. Now U.S. Airways is kicking the tires for a potential acquisition of American, which will simply mean less competition in the marketplace. And, well, you know what that means for prices. David, you know, I hate these fees. You hate these fees. Most consumers hate them. But when I talk to the people in the airlines, as you sort of alluded to, American making a billion, they're making so much money off of this. There's just no way they're going to get rid of these fees, are they? 
No, they're, they're not going to walk away from fees because the fee income is too important, just like with banks, for example, where we've been seeing a greater percentage of their revenue coming from fees. And so they're very reluctant to walk away from the fee structure as well. It, it's very tricky for consumers, and not least of which, it just gets increasingly hard to comparison shop. For example, if you go to Expedia and book an, an American Airlines ticket there, you can't pick a seat there. You then need to go back to the American Airlines website to pick your seat. And if so it's near a window or forth. something, you've got to pay more, right? Or, or, or at the bulk end, I saw oh, you've got to pay more. Yeah, exactly. You might have to pay an extra $42, and now they're introducing other tiers that will require these upgrades as well. I think it's just a matter of time before there's going to be standing room on these flights. <laughs> I know that the FAA, I'm not kidding, I, I couldn't make this up if I tried. In fact, over in, uh, in England, they're, they're already examining this as a possibility. The airlines, there's no danger here whatsoever. Takeoffs and landings, piece of cake. I'm thinking to myself, wait a minute, I've seen a lot of footage of really scary trips. I not want to I was strapped during that. David, I can't wait till they start charging for you to use a bathroom. Bring a lot of quarters. <laughs> and you know that's inevitable too. <laughs> well, you didn't have to travel far to see a spectacular natural phenomenon happening right along our shores this week. Paul, tell us about king tides and uh, why are they getting people so excited? These are the highest tides of the year. And if you remember back to your uh, high school uh, science class, tides are caused by the gravitational pull of the moon. And what happens is the moon doesn't go in a circular orbit around the Earth. It orbits every 29 days in an elliptical orbit. So sometimes the moon is closer to the Earth than other times. And when it's closer, th there's a greater gravitational pull. And the moon is pulling the water, causing a bulge basically in, in the ocean, which causes uh, the tides. And um, this week, Wednesday, uh, peaking on Thursday, and also Friday, uh, the tides were, were uh, several feet higher in most places than they are throughout the rest of the year. We had some uh, minor flooding on the Embarcadero there in San Francisco, uh, on the uh, exit off Highway 101 to get into Mill Valley, uh, around Lake Merritt. And basically, uh, it was also a great opportunity to do some tide pooling as well, because the high is higher than normal, but the low is much lower than normal. And so um, the people who got out uh, and went to places like Fitzgerald Marine Reserve on the San Mateo coast, you could walk much, much further out at low tide, hundreds of yards further than you otherwise would have been able to. And it was a great opportunity to teach your kids about, um, you know, starfish and anemones and, and all the other critters out there. Will the uh, severity of the uh, king tides uh, be exacerbated by global warming? Any tides? You know, it's interesting because uh, I think Hurricane Sandy really uh, woke a lot of people up about the risk of rising sea level uh, in the future for coastal communities. 75% of California residents live within an hour of the coast. Mm -hmm. And, you know, basically the ocean has already risen eight inches in the last 100 years. We can measure that by the tidal gauge at Fort Point in San Francisco, which has sat there for more than 100 years, the same gauge, the same water. It's, this is not, you know, Al Gore's theories or something. These are very measurable phenomena and empirical data. And basically, uh, as the ocean continues to rise, uh, we're going to see more days like these high water events. So there's a nonprofit group called the California King Tides Initiative, and there are similar ones in Oregon, Washington, British Columbia, uh, that asks people to go out and photograph this phenomena before and after to, and post them on websites so you can see what the future is going to be like. Okay. David, you had a question? Yeah, we also had some flooding down here because of the king tide. But, Paul, I'm, I'm wondering about how do you stem the tide, as it were, in terms of climate change? We've got wealthy homeowners in Malibu and elsewhere down in Southern California who are out of their own pocket trying to restore beaches before their beachfront homes wash away. Are we expecting California to provide subsidies or any sort of effort to try and preserve, uh, preserve coastal communities? Um, Basically, no is the answer because uh, you can't stop the ocean. And, you know, there was a, a report by the National Academy of Sciences uh, that came out this summer showing that at the current rate, uh, the ocean is going to rise as much as one foot by 2030. And that's not really that long from now when you think about it. I mean, that's, that's you know, 18 years. It's going to rise as much as two feet by 2050 uh, and as much as five feet by 2100. When you think about San Francisco Bay, five feet uh, is amazing. The, the runways at San Francisco Airport, Oakland Airport will be underwater. The San Francisco Giants will have to build major flood walls around the ballpark so that the center field isn't full up with uh, 
fish, uh, wow. you know, at high tide. <laughs> and then, um, you know, not only that, the question is who pays for all this? There's going to come a point where they do what's called managed retreat. We're already seeing it in some places where if, you're, if your apartment building or your house is starting to fall into the ocean, it's too bad, basically. Uh, you have to move it backwards. And they're not going, you know, the Coastal Commission and, and other agencies are not going to give as many permits uh, or any, frankly, for building close to the ocean or the bay anymore. You mentioned uh, Al Gore, yeah. which alludes to the whole politics around climate change. I find it ironic that now the science is catching up, uh, or, or the reality is catching up to what the scientists told us 20 years ago. It's too late whether we believe it or not anymore, isn't it? That's right. The only question now with climate change is how severe is it going to be? Uh, and we still have time uh, to, to lessen the impact. You think of these big storms like Sandy, you know, th that's where it really gets bad. A few inches of ocean rise normally isn't too bad, but if it's a couple of feet, then you're going to have bad, you know, bad problems. So we can make changes and lessen the damage. All right. Well, thank you, Paul. And that's our show for tonight. So I want to thank our just for, just for joining us tonight. And we hope that you'll visit our website, kqed.org slash this week. That's where you can watch complete episodes, subscribe to our newsletter and podcast, and share your thoughts about the show. Next week, tune in for Heat and Harvest, a look at the impact of climate change on agriculture in California. I'm Yul Kwan. Good night.